Chapter 14 Kitty Salone sank back into the bed, sobbing weakly. Pat drew the covers up over her and hovered over her anxiously for a moment to be sure she had completely recovered from the awful fright brought on by Ezra's sudden appearance at her window. Just take it easy, Kitty, he kept reassuring her. Just lay, just lay back and take it easy. Don't you worry nothing. I'll stay right here and there'll be nothing that'll happen to you. Ezra's face, she moaned. That look in his eyes when he started through the window. He, he start crazy, Pat. I thought about those other people he killed. I don't know. I didn't know where you were. I didn't know if you could get here in time. She drew in a great shuddering breath and twisted her head to look up at Pat's face. Is he? Did you? I just, I just knocked him out cold, Pat told her grimly. I, I couldn't think what else to do and with you being so scared of him and all. Not that I believe any of them things against Ezra, he went on with his face hardening. I just couldn't stand to see you being scared at a time like this. But he's crazy, Pat. He must be. Didn't you see that terrible look on his face? Pat shook his head stubbornly. Things are, can be funny, and they can be happening sometimes, he admitted. Things we don't know nothing about. Nothing could ever make me believe that Ezra meant you any harm when he climbed in the window. It seemed to me like maybe he wasn't thinking just straight, but, but that's all. He leaned down by the side of the bed to examine the inert hulk of bloodied flesh laying on the floor. Ezra's single eye was closed and he was breathing slowly but regularly. Pat felt over the top of his head with practiced fingertips and observed with satisfaction that the barrel of the gun hadn't dented Ezra's hard skull. The big man's face was battered, and there was bruises and abrasions all up and down his shoulders and back. None of the wounds seemed serious, but it was evident he had lost a lot of blood. Pat couldn't figure out what caused all the small wounds. He looked like he'd been fighting an army that had attacked him with knives and clubs. He wondered how Ezra had got here. He hadn't heard any horse approaching. He went to the window and peered out and was more puzzled than ever. There wasn't any saddled horse outside, and it looked like Ezra had just sort of materialized out of nothing. He frowned sharply as he leaned out the window. His ears caught a faint rumble that was like the faraway roll of thunder. But it couldn't be thunder. The evening sky was clear of clouds. It wasn't thunder. It was the drumming of many hooves approaching across the level plains from the southwest. Must be twenty riders, Pat thought though he couldn't see them through the deepening twilight. And as they were coming at a driving gallop that would bring them to the express station in a matter of moments. He understood now. Ezra had been fleeing for his life, instinctively turning to Sam Salone for help. That explained the wild look on his face as dive through the open window without waiting to go around to the door. He didn't know about Kitty, of course. He didn't know she would have been in bed trying to have a baby and then his sudden appearance would have frightened her so badly. A dust of cloud dust was beginning to boil up over the plains and the pound of galloping hooves were becoming plain now. Pat drew back inside the room and pulled the window shade. He turned and met Kitty's eyes, knew that she heard the riders now and that she guessed what the sound was. I reckon they're after Ezra. Pat told her harshly. He came to Sam for help, and they wouldn't get him here. Let me handle it. He stopped and got his good hand under Ezra's shoulder, heaved and tugged, and managed to roll the unconscious body underneath Kitty's bed. The labor pains were beginning to come back on her. When he straightened up again, he nodded approvingly and said, Don't hold back. I'm going to bluff him, and you got to help. They won't come in here when a woman's about to have a baby. I'll go out and tell them, and you back me up by yelling some. You got to help, Kitty. Sam would want it that way. Kitty nodded, said through clenched teeth, I know. I'll do whatever you want. You don't worry about me. And don't you be worrying about anything. Pat threw a hurried look about the room, then walked out. The riders were very close now. They were pulling up in front of the station. Pat stalked out to the door and flung it open. Twenty or more armed men were milling about on sweaty, excited horses. 
Some of them were dismounting, while others pulled away from the main group as though they planned to surround the station. One swift glance told Pat that the group was made up of his friends and neighbors throughout the valley, with none of Harlow's men among them. But that didn't make them less dangerous. They were aroused and mad, mad by blood, thirst by the awful crimes charged against Ezra, and Pat knew they would waste little time arguing about it if they got hold of the fugitive now. He stepped easily out of the door and raised his right hand in a calm gesture of greeting. He called out, Hey there, Nate. What's all the excitement about? Nate Turner was just stepping off his horse. One of the older of the valley residents, Pat selected him as the probable leader. He saw the others looking at him queerly and heard his name being whispered from mouth to mouth as Turner came towards him. Nate stopped ten feet in front of Pat and said gravely, There ain't no use trying to cover up for him no longer, Pat. Where's he at? Who? Ezra. The syllables came out with an explosiveness of a gunshot. Pat shrugged his shoulders and asked mildly, What do you all want with him? Turner's gaze held Pat steadily. He's got to hang, Pat. Being your friend won't help him none. We've come after him and we're going to be taking him. Hold on a minute. What's Ezra done that you're hanging in, in a hanging mood for? What's he done? Nate Turner exploded. Are you standing there and telling me that you don't know? That's just what I'm doing. He killed four people last night after you turned him out of jail. Ethan Page and his wife, Miss Kincaid and Jake Morton murdered them all in cold blood, Pat, without giving them any of them a chance. And just a while ago, he rolled hell-bent into the Troll Bridge Ranch all naked and bleeding and stole a fresh horse and made it away before little Tessie Tollbridge could get away and call her paw on the hands. He's got to be stopped before he kills anybody, Pat. Don't be making the mistake of shielding them. Turner went on grimly. We mean business, and if you stand in our way, it'll be just as bad for you. Ain't that the way it is, boys? He turned to the others. Heads were nodding vigorously, and there were growls of assent. All this is plum crazy, Pat protested. Ezra was with me all night after I helped him break jail. How in the hell could he been riding around killing people like that? Turner shook his head angrily. It won't do any good to lie for him. If you were with him, by God, that makes you a candidate for hanging too. Hand him over to us, Pat. What makes you think that he's here? Where else would he be? Turner asked bitterly. You and Sam are the only friends he's got. And we come across his horse about a mile back with his leg broke from stepping in a prairie dog hole. Ezra just about had enough time to make it here on foot, and we know you and Sam are hiding him. Tell Sam to bring him out if he don't want his house burned down. There is no mistake in the violent, ugly humor of the Powder Valley Posse. Pat knew that no arguments, however plausible, would prevail against their determination to take Ezra's life. They were all convinced that he was a mad killer and that nothing would change that. Sam ain't here, Pat said coolly. He's due to be here. He rode the mail down to Dutch Springs this morning. He rode for Doc Trimble, Pat explained loudly, hoping Kitty would hear. His wife's in a bad way with the baby coming and I stayed to help all I could. I ain't seen hiding her hair of Ezra since this morning, Pat went on heedily. I swear he ain't killed nobody anyway. Swearing won't bring any of them back to life, Nate told him, and we're not swallowing any of your story about Kitty Salone neither. Why, I talked to Doc Trimble just yesterday, and it's, he said it'd be a couple more weeks. And how'd you get shot up anyway? He added curiously. Pass grimaced down his left shoulder. 
It's a long story, and you would just go calling me a liar if I was to tell you anyway. But Kitty Sloan is the only one in the house, and I can prove it. He stopped for a moment to listen. A high-pitched cry of agony came from the little shack behind him. He nodded with satisfaction and said that. Hear that? That sound like Kitty's baby's two weeks off? They all heard it. They all listened intently, and some of their heads began nodding doubtfully. Pat pressed his advantage home. I don't understand none of this foolishness about Ezra killing people last night, but do you think I'd leave a crazy murderer inside the house with Kitty at a time like this? Friend or not, do you think I'd do that to Kitty? I reckon you'd do almost anything, said Turner, keeping Ezra out of sight and keeping him from being caught. If I knew he was a killer, Pat demanded angrily, I wouldn't lift a hand to save him, and you know it, Nate. You and all the rest of you, damn it, use some sense. He lifted his voice and played his trump card. I can't stand out here talking to you while Kitty's in this condition. I got water boiling on the stove, and maybe she needs me right now. Come on, two or three in. Search the house if you think I'm lying. But by God, take it easy, and don't let on to Kitty that you're hunting for any madman. You know that might mark her baby. The men nodded uneasy assent. Some of them moved forward to hold a whispered conference with Nate Turner, and all of them were listening with at least one ear to the sound of prenatal distress coming from Kitty's bedroom. Pat turned his back on them and threw a parting shot over his shoulder. You're wasting time around here. Better come on and see for yourselves and ride back to where you found Ezra's horse and pick up the trail from there. If you all are right about him, he's more than likely murdering some more women and children while you're all ganged up here. He reached the door and stepped inside and struck a match and boldly lit a kerosene lamp in a wall bracket by the door. Kitty's moans of anguish began pulsing out through the open door from her darkened bedroom. Nate and Turner and two other older ranchers came to the door hastily. They looked ashamed at their own insistence but were determined to do their duty. Pat lifted down the lamp and moved it to where it would light every corner of the room and then led them into the small kitchen. The stove was cherry red and all the water was boiling rapidly in buckets and pots. Nate rubbed his jaw and stared sagely at the supply of boiling water and muttered in a low voice, Well, that's the ticket, all right. Plenty of hot water. Pat shrugged and led the way back into the living room. The only other room you ain't looked in yet is the bedroom. You want to look in there? Under Kitty's bed, perhaps? He moved open the door, holding the lamp above his head so the light would touch Kitty's contorted face on the pillow. No, I don't reckon we need to, do we, fellers? The others shook their heads and backed away discerningly. Two horses galloped up as they all went away towards the door. They stepped aside to get out of Sam Sloan's way as he flung himself inside, his face drawn and bitter. How's she coming? he demanded harshly of Pat. Do these yahoos think this here's a circus or what? She's all right, you got the doc? You're right behind me. Sam turned angrily on the three ranchers who were backing towards the door. Ain't y'all had no upbringing? he demanded scathingly. Can't a woman have a baby without the whole damn valley pushing in to get some grandstand seats? Doc Trimble came shambling in just then. He was a small and tidy man, wearing thick lens glasses emitting an alcoholic odor. He glared around at the five men in the living room and snapped. All right, clear out. I'll you now. I got my work cut out for me and I don't want to be bothered by any blundering idiots. He snatched the lamp from Pat's hand and hurried in to Katie while the ranchers filed out with Pat and Sam behind him. I don't know what it's all about, Pat said aloud to Sam with a warning wink. They all come busting up here with some hullabaloo about chasing Ezra and him running around crazy and killing people and such crazy talk. They thought that you and me was hiding them and wouldn't believe me when I said that you was riding for the doctor. We're mighty sorry for butting in, Nate Turner apologized. I guess maybe he didn't come this way after all. We'll be riding on, I guess. 
Well, you're here. One of you might well make yourselves up and useful. And ride to the lazy mare to get Sally. Pat grated. She's gonna feel pretty bad about not being here to help. Sure, said Turner hastily. Glad to be neighborly and help out. I'll send one of the boys fast as he can ride. And, uh, don't tell her nothing about me being shot up or nothing about Ezra and that stuff. Pat shouted after him. She'll be worried enough about Kitty. As the ranchers mounted and prepared to ride away, Pat explained to Sam in a low voice. Kitty's fine. There's lots of hot water and everything's all right, except that Ezra's laying under her bed knocked out. He was getting away from that posse and come and climbed in that window and scared her near to death. I knocked him out so he wouldn't be, she wouldn't be any more scared. Does she know what they're saying about him? Sam demanded. Yep, that's why she was so scared. She was awake and heard Oscar, Penrose, and us talking. Sam drew him further away from the house and spoke in a low, troubled tone. It's looking worser and worser for Ezra all the time. In Dutch Springs, I heard that Jake Morton had willed his ranch to Ezra just a few weeks ago. Willed his ranch to Ezra? Why'd he do that? Pat echoed with sharp incredulity. God knows, but no reason anybody knows except how Jake hated Eustace Arlo and wouldn't sell or borrow from him. Folks thinks he was scared his ranch would go on the open market after he died, so he just ups and wills it to Ezra just out of sheer orneriness. So I reckon they're saying that Ezra murdered him to get a hold of the six sections? Pat guessed disgustingly. Well, that's about it. And what about the Pages and Ms. Kincaid? Had they had their ranches willed to Ezra too? No, nope, not that anyone knows. Nobody knows any reason why he'd kill them two, but they think maybe they'll find out a reason later. Harlow's got himself in solid with a lot of them, Sam went on angrily, by coming out today with $2,000 in cash that Ethan Page was borrowing from him on the ranch and had never gotten hold of. Harlow, he's given it to the Page kids, and folks think that's mighty generous of them because they say he could have kept quiet about it and tore up the mortgage and kept his money if he had been a mind to. You mean he's got a signed mortgage from Ethan Page? That's right, but nobody else knowing Ethan had signed it yet. So Harlow's showing off being honest about it and forking over the money anyhow. Pat Stevens sank back onto his haunches by the side of the shack and slowly rolled a cigarette. Everything was quiet inside. Dr. Trimble had taken over with his customary efficiency, and both men were ceasing to worry about Kitty. As long as the doctor was sober enough to walk, he was capable of delivering a baby. Pat put his cigarette and lit it, and then said musingly, I don't reckon Harlow had a mortgage on the Kincaid Ranch too, did he? No, nope. the old lady was dead set against borrowing money. But George probably borrows some now with her mom being dead. Which would be a pretty good reason for Eustace Arlo for wanting her dead, muttered Pat. I thought about that too. Sam shook his head worryingly. But it doesn't work out with Jake Morton and the Pages. Harlow didn't have any reason for wanting them dead. Might have, might have thought that about the pages if he held out the money Ethan had borrowed, but he spiked that by coming right out and saying he's holding it for the kids. And with Jake's ranch willed to Ezra like it was, it didn't do a Harlow no good for Jake to die neither. But maybe Arlo didn't know about Jake's will, Pat pointed out. I don't reckon very many people did. Well, maybe not, but that still don't give him no reason for wanting the pages dead. Look here, Sam exclaimed. You're figuring the same way I am about them murderers. You know Ezra didn't do them, did you? I'd like it better if I hadn't seen him shoot at me, Pat muttered. That is right. Sam was taken aback. 
"'Twouldn't do Harlow no good to kill you. "'Anyhow, how could anybody mistake anybody else for Ezra? "'God knows there ain't another soul in the world that ugly, I reckon. "'That's probably one reason,' Pat argued. "'Why it'd be easier to fix up a disguise to look like him? "'Because he's so danged ugly. "'It'd be harder to fix up to look like a common hombre like me.' But I haven't got red whiskers and a scarred face and one eye. You know what I mean? I kind of see what you're saying. Sam muttered thoughtfully. You mean another feller wouldn't have to look too much like him to make everyone think twas Ezra right away. Red whiskers and a twisted up face. He stopped suddenly. But who would do it? And who got Ezra out of jail? And where was y'all last night? Those are things I'd like to ask Ezra, Pat replied grimly. He threw away his cigarette and got up. Let's drag him out of Kitty's room and see if we can wake him up yet. Sam went in with them. There was a light in the kitchen and they stopped at the living room table and looked through the open door to see Doc Trimble standing there draining the last drop out of the pint whiskey bottle that Pat had dropped on the floor when he ran in to rescue Kitty from Ezra. Doc looked at them, unabashed, and said mournfully, Somebody spilled most of it on the floor here. A mighty careless way to treat whiskey. Must have lots more around, huh? His gaze roved avidly around the kitchen. Pat laughed and told them, No, Sam never has but one bottle here at a time. You oughtn't to soak yourself with whiskey know how. Sam reproved him. Why aren't you in there taking care of Kitty? Well, because Kitty's in there taking care of herself, Doc Trimble hiccuped gently. I gave her something to keep her quiet for a couple hours. You might use some of this hot water to scrub up the blood off the bedroom floor. He went on with a wave of his arm through the steaming containers on the stove. And I'd be obliged if you'll remove the corpse from underneath the bed. I didn't like to mention it while those other men were here, but the presence of corpses in a delivery room is really distasteful to me. Both men started guiltily. Pat swallowed hard and said in a hushed voice, Did you say a corpse, Doc? Well, I didn't examine him closely, the doctor admitted. I assumed he was dead when he didn't object after I gave him a couple kicks. Both men hurried into the bedroom. Kitty was laying on her side, sleeping peacefully under the influence of the potion the doctor administered. Sam knelt beside the bed and felt for Ezra anxiously and then breathed a sigh of relief and muttered, He's still warm, Pat. Let's roll him out of here. They tugged at him and rolled him out from underneath the bed. And then Sam got him by the heels and dragged him across the floor into the living room. Doc Trimble stood in the kitchen door and observed them with a professional interest. So it's Ezra, huh? He murmured. I guessed as much when Kitty asked me not to betray his presence under her bed. A fine lady, that. Most inconsiderate in being too impatient to wait the two weeks I had planned for her. He came and knelt by Ezra's side and made a daft examination of the unconscious man while Sam and Pat drew back and watched him. Well, he's got a good solid head. He'll be right in a couple hours. He got up and dust off his hands. Well, can't we wake him before that, Doc? Well, I don't know how. You might hit him again in the same place. Safer, probably, though, to let him sleep it off. He walked in to see how his patient was resting. Pat and Sam studied the big man dubiously. Two hours yet before he wakes up, Sam groaned. Seems like we never will find out. He stopped speaking and turned to look at Pat as they heard a rider coming up outside. By common consent, they quickly went to the door and stepped out into the cool of the evening. The rider was Pinky Wright, 
owner of a small horse ranch west of the express station and a few miles south of Dutch Springs. He was leading two horses, and he looked dusty and tired. Evening, he greeted Pat and Sam. I've been riding by and thought I'd say howdy. Didn't know I'd find you here, Pat. He looked curiously at Pat's wounded arm, but didn't mention it. Squat and roll a cigarette, Sam replied hospitally. Doc trembles inside with Kitty. That's why I bestn't ask you to stay for supper. Is Kitty sick? Sam's sicker than she is, Pat chuckled. It's always harder on the papas than the mamas. Oh, ho! Pinky nodded knowingly. He rolled a cigarette and then added casually, I've been riding the range all day hunting a pair of cussed strays. He jerked his head towards the lead horses. Didn't know anything about none of the trouble in the valley till a few minutes ago when I met up with one of the VX hands riding home from town. He told me a plum mouthful. About Ezra? Sam asked angrily. Yeah, Jake Martin and the Pages, all right. They claim that you turned Ezra out of jail last night and let him go off a-killin', he told Pat. Pat didn't say anything. He knew Pinky right well. They'd always been friends. He didn't want to smash up that friendship now that if he could avoid it. He told me about Jake Martin willing his ranch to Ezra and about his boss being so generous and offering to pay over $2,000 to the page kids that Ethan had borrowed but had never gotten from him. Pinky went on deliberately. And it kind of sort of surprised me. You see, I talked to Ethan Page last night, right after the meeting, and he was plumb boiling mad about how everyone that owed Harlow money voted the way he wanted and put triple in for sheriff, and Ethan swore and be damned that he changed his mind and wasn't going to be borrowing that money from Harlow after all. And the funny thing is, I heard him tell Harlow so. Harlow didn't know I was listening, and I didn't mean to, but I heard Ethan say that he wasn't going to buy to sign that mortgage that Harlow had just drawn up, and that Harlow might just as well tear it up. Pinky Wright stopped to draw in a deep breath after this long speech, and for a moment the silence was unbroken. Then Pat leaned forward and asked sharply, you heard Ethan Page tell Harlow he wasn't going to sign that mortgage? That's right. And Ethan rode off for home right afterwards. So I sort of wonder how that mortgage got signed. Did you say anything about that to Harlow's hand just now? Pat asked in a hushed tone of excitement. I sure did. I told him a lot of folks was going to wonder the same thing when I told them what I heard Ethan tell Harlow last night. Pinky stood up and yawned. Didn't know that you'd be here, Pat, but I reckon Sam would like to know what with all this crazy talk going round about Ezra shooting these people. Looks to me like Harlow had it done, Pinky went on sharply on account he wanting to get a hold of Ethan's ranch and Ethan deciding not to borrow from him after all. You're practically accusing Arlo of forging Ethan's signature to that mortgage after Ethan was dead, Pat mused. Why, yes, I reckon that's about the way it stacks up. I never did trust that Harlow fellow. Pinky started towards his horse. Wait a minute, Pat called. Does that VX hand know that you've been horse hunting all day and haven't told this to anyone else? I reckon he does. I remember telling him I was too doggone tired to ride into town tonight, but I'd sure spread the story around the valley to Mari. Pinky gathered up his reins and mounted. You know what that means? Sam demanded excitingly as Pinky rode away. It means Harlow will have to kill Pinky tonight before he gets a chance to tell anyone about the forgery. That's just what it means. Pat lunged to his feet. Hook up two fast horses to your buckboard and help me load Ezra in. 
I'm putting him back into jail so there won't be any questions where he is tonight while someone's getting that pinky. End of chapter 14.